continuing on with chapter 23. So after we do our scene size up, the next thing is the primary assessment looking for those life threats. So first thing we want to do is form a general impression. So sick, not sick, stable, unstable, and then the APU scale to determine level of consciousness. We then move on to ABC, so airway and breathing, make sure they're adequate. Um, and then circulation, this is going to be a big one. Make sure that you palpate a pulse and then look at skin color, temperature, and texture to see if the patient is having some blood loss. Just because the uterus has a direct opening to the outside doesn't mean that there hasn't been some sort of internal rupture, an ectopic pregnancy, something like that, where you're not going to necessarily see the bleeding. You might see mild bleeding, but not enough to cause pale, cool, clammy skin, but that's what the patient's presenting with. Um, a lot of times, um, gynecologic emergencies are not going to be life-threatening, but we need to assess and treat for shock um, or a rapid pulse um, that particularly is weak to make sure that we transport emergently. For history taking, always investigate your chief complaint. Some questions may be extremely personal. So try and keep things as private as possible. Don't have a bunch of people standing around as you're asking about menstruation and the possibility of um, pregnancy, especially the younger you get. So an adolescent girl may not want to tell you that she's been sexually active, especially if she's got a parent around. So maybe just ask them to step away while you talk to them um, so that you can get the appropriate information. For abdominal pain, you want to ask about onset, duration, quality, and radiation. So basically your OPQRST. And then those pertinent positives and negatives. So those things that you would expect to be there or that shouldn't be there. So things like syncope, lightheadedness, nausea, vomiting, and fever are all those kind of associated symptoms that you would expect to see with abdominal pain. So if they're there, it makes sense. If they're not, then, um, you know, that's what's called a pertinent negative. Something isn't quite adding up. For vaginal bleeding, you want to ask about the onset as well, the duration, and then the quantity. So the number of sanitary pads that are soaked. And this isn't like there's a little bit of blood, so she changed it. This is like soaked, like legitimately a fair amount of blood on there and you want to go by the number that she has soaked it per hour. It's really hard to determine with tampons so for women we say if you have vaginal bleeding you should switch over to sanitary pads so you can actually estimate the uh, amount of blood loss. Then we're going to move into the sample history. Um, make sure that you ask about any birth control pills, devices, um, intrauterine devices. Um, are birth control that are actually just placed in the uterus and left there. Some pump out just small amounts of hormones. Others don't have hormones. They utilize other methods to prevent ovulation or implantation. So make sure you ask about that. Ask the patient about any medical conditions, last menstrual period, was it normal, heavier than normal, um, longer or shorter than normal, and then ask about the possibility of STDs. Secondary assessment um, may be performed on scene or en route. Um, oftentimes it's easier to perform this en route because then you can ensure a little more privacy for the patient. Um, some things that you want to go through with your secondary is vital signs. Uh, you want to take a look at the abdomen for distension or tenderness, any sort of guarding. You may have to actually look at the genitalia to see if you have any visible bleeding and then continue to talk to your patient so you can continue to um, assess your patient's mental status. If they're talking to you normally, then you know that they're doing pretty good. If they start getting 
abnormally sleepy, start mumbling, start not answering questions the way that you would expect them to, you know that something's going on with their mental status. Physical examinations, make sure that you limit them. If you don't have to look, don't look. Be very professional. Um, really, you're only going to have to examine the genitalia if it's necessary for you to do so. More often than not, it's just going to be with trauma. So if they're not having any sort of trauma, a lot of times you won't need to look. Um, if they believe that they could be pregnant or they say that they have a lot of pressure, you may want to just double check really quick, just do a little look-see uh, to make sure that they aren't um, in labor and they didn't know that they were pregnant. That has happened before. Um, but try to limit the amount of personnel present. Try and help with um, modesty. You don't have to completely expose her to the world. Just a quick little look in most cases is all that's necessary. So lifting the blanket to the side is perfectly good enough. Um, focus your physical exam on the nature of illness, the patient's chief complaint for vaginal bleeding. You want to visualize the bleeding to try and get a good sense of how severe it is. Um, asking about the quality of the bleeding. So what does it look like? Um, do you have a lot of clots? That sort of thing, as well as the quantity. Um, you want to use external pads to control vaginal bleeding. So we do have just big maxi pads in the ambulance. That's what you want to use. We're not packing the vagina. We're not putting any sort of gauze or um, tampons or anything inside. It's all going to be external. Keep the possibility of hypoperfusion or shock in mind. Always ask if there's pain associated with the bleeding. And like I said, no um, internal sources to stop the bleeding whatsoever. Observe for vaginal discharge and make observations about it. So you want to know thickness, you want to know color, are there any smells associated, you want to note amount. And then syncope, fever, nausea, and vomiting are considered significant signs and symptoms when you're dealing with gynecologic emergencies. Syncope especially is considered um, a sign of shock unless proven otherwise. Fever it indicates a severe infection. Uh, for your vital signs, we're going to assess vital signs just like everything else. Um, you may want to consider getting orthostatic vital signs if the bleeding is known or suspected just to see if your patient has a positive uh, orthostatic blood pressure. Um, that could indicate that your patient is hypoperfusing um, or having signs and symptoms of shock. For reassessment, you're just going to repeat your primary assessment, reassess vital signs in the chief complaint, identify and change, treat any changes in the patient's condition, and then pay specific attention to the overall needs of your patient. Um, try and accommodate her desire for either conversation or silence, just because oftentimes these are quite embarrassing, can be quite overwhelming for the patient as well. So if she wants to talk, find something to talk about that typically doesn't involve what's going on with her. Once you get through your reassessment, you've got some time to have an actual conversation with your patient. If she doesn't want to talk, that's fine too. For your interventions, there's typically very few interventions that we're going to actually do with a gynecologic emergency. Um, you may have to treat for hyperperfusion or shock, keep the patient warm. Um, position of comfort is typically how we're going to transport. You may have to provide supplemental oxygen. Um, if the patient is bleeding pretty significantly, you may want to call ALS because they may need to do some fluid replacement and then transport's going to be the biggest. Um, for communication and documentation, you're going to give a nice, thorough um, 
report to the hospital, carefully document anything, especially if you have cases of sexual assault, so patient's condition, chief complaint, anything that you noted about the scene itself, and then all interventions that you um, have performed and the patient's response to those. For emergency medical care, the big thing is just maintaining the patient's privacy as much as possible. If in a public place, try and move her to the ambulance so you don't have a big crowd around. People are drawn to the lights and sirens and you really don't wanna be showing your business in front of God and country. So don't expect that of a patient either. If possible, have a female EMT participate as the main provider for the patient. If there is extensive internal vaginal bleeding, um, really determining the cause of the bleeding is much less important than actually treating the patient for shock and transporting. So you don't necessarily need to determine where the bleeding is coming from. Uh, most women will use sanitary pads to control bleeding before you arrive. Um, make sure that we go ahead and replace that, use a sanitary pad. If we replace the pad when we first get there, then we can get a better idea of how profuse the actual bleeding is. If we put a new pad on and by the time we get to the hospital, it's soaked, then we know it's pretty significant. Document the number of sanitary pads that were saturated with blood. And oftentimes this is gonna be what the patient states, but they often don't allow it to get completely saturated. So you need to ask like how much blood was on there. Did you like get a little bit and change it or was it like literally soaking? Um, if the woman has a tampon in place, it's not necessary for it to be removed. But again, if you put a new pad on, then you really can get a good feel for how much bleeding is going on. Uh, the external genitalia have a very rich nerve supply, which means that injuries, problems with this area tend to be pretty painful. We want to use just regular local pressure to control bleeding that's external. You can use a diaper type bandage to hold any sort of dressings in place. Um, under no circumstance do we pack or place dressings in the vagina. Never, 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 never. It's all gonna be external. Assessment and management of specific conditions. So public inflammatory disease we talked about. Uh, a patient with PID will complain of abdominal pain. Um, usually that pain is going to be associated with uh, their menstrual period. So it's good to know the date of the last menstrual period so you can see if that correlates. Uh, the pain is going to be made worse by walking. Um, patients often present with kind of a distinctive gait that kind of looks like a shuffle because it does hurt to walk. Pre-hospital treatment's pretty limited. There's really not a whole lot we're gonna do for these patients. Non-emergency transport is usually recommended because PID itself is very rarely a threat to life but it can be serious enough to require transport to the hospital just to make sure really the possibility of sterility and the higher incidence of ectopic pregnancy is going to be more severe than the inflammation itself. We're going to go ahead and stop here and we'll go on in the next one.